Okay, welcome everybody to this interview of Dr. Barbara Corky. My name is Darlene Sandoval. I am a professor of pediatrics at University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Jane? Hi, my name is Jane Roosh. I'm past president for medicine and science of the ADA, and I am a physician scientist investigator also at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus and the Rocky Mountain Regional VA. All right, so I am so pleased to introduce Bar Barbara Corky. She is Emeritus Professor in Medicine and Biochemistry at Boston University. Barbara has been a critical leader in our diabetes field, and we won't say how long, but um, she has produced 180 publications, over 180 publications, with 40 years of research support for her work. This work has led, has advanced our understanding of fuel-stimulated insulin secretion, fuel participation, fuel partitioning in adipose tissue, and cytokine signaling. She's been highly recognized for her work, including an NIH Merit Award, the National Honor Society of Women in Chemistry, the George Bray Founders Award of the Obesity Society, the Charles A. Best Lectureship uh, and Award from the University of Toronto, and, the, and uh, the Banting Medal, last but not least, the Banting Medal for Scientific Achievement from the American Diabetes Association. And I am just listing a few highlights from her amazing CV. So we're going to ask Barbara several questions about her career trajectory and, and career development. And we hope that her story, which I think is fascinating, um, will be inspiring to all of you. Jane? Yeah, so thanks. I First off, I want to uh, express my gratitude uh, to you, Barbara, for being here to talk to us today in our inaugural interview with women who are transforming um, the field of diabetes research. And uh, I want to personally acknowledge a big fascination that I have with you because I also started my scientific career late as, as, a, as a fellow with very little research experience and entered into the field of research. And so um, you had worked for a while in a lab before deciding to go and get your graduate training. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what inspired you to move from working in a lab to, to going to graduate school? You're muted. <laughs> You're, you're muted, Barbara. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be working with you ladies and to be promoting women in leadership and diabetes. I think it's about time. So to answer your question, I had a very unusual trajectory. I was an undergraduate taking medical school courses in a combined, what I thought was going to be a combined MD, BA program. And I encountered a fascinating research project and quit medical school and undergraduate and went to work in the lab where this work was going on. Yeah. So and yeah, and so and so you did that. And what was that exciting project that got you to go there, um, do that work, and then truncate your your postdoctoral training um, to sort of move to the next question? So, what was your first question, and what drove you to that second question? Okay, so I didn't. Uh, the first question was just fascination. I didn't know enough to have a good question, and the experience was a. A very senior scientist called Otto Levy, who was perfusing a heart in this little tiny, looked like a closet to me. And I stopped in and I said, how do you do that? I, you know, I couldn't imagine why the heart was beating uh, completely detached from any organism. And so he showed me what happens when you change calcium in the perfusate, it stops, and then he put it back again, it starts again. And I thought, wow, this is this is the kind of thing I'd much rather be doing than trying to deal with patients who had no patience for me because I probably looked like a 12 year old little girl. And uh, you, you may have had similar experiences in your medical training, but I wasn't encouraging. So I went to work in, in the Department of Pharmacology at NYU and I worked with a guy uh, who developed the so-called steel equations that are used to this day to 
determine glucose disposal in living people usually. And so we were perfusing radioactive uh, glucose and then taking blood samples, measuring glucose. And this brilliant man, Bob Steele, uh, de determined the uh, calculations that are needed to figure out how much glucose was being taken up, how much was being produced. So that was my first entry into the diabetes field. And the work was wonderful. And, and he was a very kind and patient person who uh, talked to me all the time and explained what was going on, treated me like a peer. Well, that's just a wonderful experience. And then, and then um, you did something really courageous. You went in, in your postdoctoral work was kind of on one topic, I think, and then you switched gears. And what inspired that, that courageous move on your part? So, so this was many years later. I was uh, uh, in my early 20s when I left my education. I was 40 when I started graduate school. And in between times, I worked in a variety of laboratories and learned an awful lot of stuff. And I had an education. It just wasn't a, the traditional route. And uh, so when I finally got a PhD, which I did fairly quickly because I was an extremely good technician by that time, and, and I, I actually knew quite a bit because my education, although not formal, was pretty extensive. And so I really didn't think I needed a postdoc. I'd already done my postdoc before I started graduate school. And uh, I, I wanted to get to where I wanted to be. And as part of this journey, I worked at Pfizer for a number of years. And I actually started their first obesity program. And, uh, I, and they, you know, they had promoted me to a scientist, even though I had no degrees. But, um, and so I worked there, I was, I was interested in diabetes, so, which was the area that they were focused on. And um, I worked with eyelids. Actually, I, I, I worked very hard to transition them from testing drugs in dogs in response or, or rats in response to a drug and then doing glucose tolerance tests to using eyelets. So I actually learned how to make eyelets. I went up to Joslin and a very nice fellow called Jurgen Steinke uh, taught me how to make eye, you know, rat eyelets. And I came back and set it up as a screen at Pfizer. So, so I knew, you know, so I had a lot of experiences by the time I started graduate school and I uh, didn't really need more exposure. I wouldn't advise anyone else to do that. I, I think that, you know, graduate uh, postdoctoral training is, is a fabulous opportunity to acquire new technology and, and also make good connections that uh, you use for the rest of your life. So had I not done that before graduate school, I think it would have been important. That was, that's really interesting. I actually did not know about the Pfizer time as well. <laughs> you, have, you have an amazing background. I want to talk a little bit, not necessarily about your specific science, but about um, how you went about um, basically your research program. So some of the strategies that you use. One of the things that we talked about recently was um, those eureka moments that you sometimes have in science. And so can you tell us about some of your favorite scientific eureka moments? Ah, okay. Um, I think one of the things that I, I remember the best is when I was working with Britain Chance at the University of Pennsylvania, as again, as a technician, um, I was looking, using spectral techniques, spectroscopy to look at the electron transport chain. And I was trying to feed in a compound at, in the middle of the chain. And I kept getting reduction of the first step, but I was going in at like the third step. And it was late at night and, and Britain Chance came back from his dinner and I, 
complained about my problem. And he uh, got all excited and said that the, this was a, a beautiful demonstration of the reversibility of the electron transport chain. And I have never forgotten that. It was just so exciting to have, you know, had this hands-on experience and realizing I, I didn't discover it, but it was my discovery to me. So that was very exciting. Um, oscillations. The when when I first became involved with oscillations and in insulin secretion, and oscillations in general. Um, being able to uh, look at a system that was oscillating when you only add one simple ingredient was, yeah, I, I never tire of that. It's still exciting. So, you know, is that enough? <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Um, one thing we talked about, uh, it was a few weeks ago now, but we were talking about the, um, the delay from when you have a published finding to the time when it's finally recognized by the field. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you've coped with that? And... That, that I think is, is critically important. So I still have on this computer that I'm talking from the first paper that I wrote. And it was it was some work that I had done at Pfizer on islets. And I wanted to find out what happened between the time you add glucose and the time that stuff changes. And we didn't know about calcium or any of this at the time. And um, so I took starved islets because I figured they'd take a much longer time to respond. And then I measured all the intermediates from glucose all the way through um, the uh, citric acid cycle, et cetera, not including that, not including calcium. And, um, and I, you know, did this, I did this beautiful study. I wrote the paper, I submitted it and it was rejected and it's still sitting here. It has never been published. And it was, you know, I had nobody to talk to and it, I was just demolished by it but I still like the data. It's really quite good. And I might find a way to get it out there someday. But in the meantime, um, I talked to a number of people and I learned that this experience was not extremely unusual. In fact, I probably can almost say with certainty that I've never had of anything I published accepted right away. It always came back with criticism, but at the time, I was so impressed with myself that I'd done all this work all by myself with my own hot little hands and to get a rejection. Oh, my God. And so, all right. So uh, you, you need to develop quite a bit of resilience and you need to talk to other people and you need to understand that, uh, you know, this is the way life is. You know, that's it. OK, so then. My early publications, some of which had to do with the oscillations and, and the metabolism that goes on in islets, um, I would go to meeting after meeting and everybody would talk about, you know, the mystery of what causes, how glucose is metabolized to generate signals, etc. And I thought, I published that. How come nobody knows this? How is this possible? And that's when I realized that, and I, I'm still struggling with this today in terms of obesity and, and type 2 diabetes, that you can know an awful lot and you can write it down and you can share it. And nobody hears what you're saying until 10 other people say the same thing and you've said it a million times. And so it's really, really important to find ways to handle that frustration and to accept it as part of, this is part of how it, what it means to be a scientist. You just don't give up. It's like being an athlete. You, um, you know, nobody's born knowing how to play tennis or volleyball or basketball. And so when you first start, you, you're, you're always terrible. And you have to just keep practicing and trying and pushing and and n not be hurt by your failure, but rather be stimulated by your failure to see what else can I do? How else can I make the point? Uh, and, and keep on building your building, 
even though no one's paying any attention. And it actually turns out in the end to almost be an advantage. So I would say that in the field that I've been in, especially the islet field, I've almost never had any competition because nobody else does the crazy things that I was doing. And I didn't do it intelligently. I mean, it wasn't because I thought this is a smart way to operate. It was kind of an accident to be off in left field in my own little corner of the world. But it turns out to have been very advantageous because nobody else was doing the same thing. And so finally, after the five, 10 years, when it's appreciated that you've done something useful, uh, you get the credit and it helps your career. So working in an area that's very unpopular is a very smart strategy if you have perseverance and good ideas, I guess. So, so speaking of the rewards, let's talk about your Banting Award. Um, so I am guessing this was a pretty significant moment in your career. Can you tell us about how the nomination came about? So that's an interesting you were the story. Second, you were the second woman, right, to win it? I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I know there have been very few up to, yeah. that, up to that time. And um, so it was a good man who is responsible for that. And he had been president of ADA, uh, just as Jane was. And uh, he uh, mentioned to me that there weren't any women getting these awards. And he said, I think you should, I think you should get it. And I thought, you don't know me. And uh, so he pushed it a little bit. And he said, you know, do you know anybody who might be willing to write a letter on your behalf? And he went and found all these people. I, I never promoted myself at all. You know, I never would have in a million years dreamt that that was something that might happen. But he went and uh, he talked to my colleagues and got a bunch of people to sign on. And uh, and during the first round, when I had been nominated, he, uh, as president, was present at the negotiations for who gets the awards, I guess. And um, he came back and he said, well, at least they talked about you. I thought, well, you know, this doesn't sound like but apparently, <laughs> I've learned since that time that uh, being discussed is uh, is one step closer to getting the award than than not. And most people get nominated and don't ever get discussed. They get to the bottom of the pile, I guess. So it it was a a very good good guy who did it, and not someone who I was terribly close to. Just a really fair minded person who felt like. Uh, in our field, we needed to be more open and and generous with women. So that's that's how it came about. And I, the main nominator was one of my very darling, longtime collaborators, which collaborators have been extremely important in my career. And um, so it was Mark Prenke who wrote the letter. Well, that that's that's an amazing story and one that doesn't happen often enough, which is part of why we have Win ADA and Wield are really to help us to to recognize people who have made major contributions and then highlight uh, women that can be beacons. So um, I, I have a, a question that is related to what you just said about collaborators and and people promoting one another, whether it is your science or whether it is your career. So let's talk a little bit about teams, which I know that you have been commonly quoted to say, you know, nothing happens without a team and, and you can't answer any big question. And I would just say that one of the inspirational things that you did for me early in my career without me having known you at all was to be talking in some, I don't even know where I was, uh, talking about teamwork and the fact that not being able to do it on your own just gives you the opportunity to to frame a better question or some quote like that that I just said 
Absolutely, because I'm a physician scientist, also studying exercise at a time when no one would want to study exercise. So I really understand that like backwater channel of, of getting somewhere. But how do you build a team if you are not that beacon that everybody wants to necessarily work with? So I think to start with, we women are natural team builders. And uh, I think that it's very often in society, looking back in history, where women work together to achieve something, raising children or, you know, gathering berries or whatever they did. Um, and so it's it's not unusual for women to think this way. And I think that it is much more so for men. So we have an advantage there. That's it, much more in our nature. The second thing is that I think maybe, may, I don't know, if, if I think it's a woman's thing as well, is to, to be happy to say, I'm really no good at this. That I have, you know, I, this is not my skill set. I, you know, I'll struggle through it. I'll do what I have to do, but I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm no good at. And so when you're no good at certain things that are important, <clears throat> then you need a team. You need somebody on your team who can be good. And, and, and this is even true of administrators. I, you know, I always hired my administrators to be as smart as I was and as competent, but in a very in a direction that compensated for my total lack of skill in that area. And so in the lab, you know, I, I was a very good technician to start with, and I knew the techniques and the methods, and which is a, a tremendous advantage. And so the first people, if actually the very first person I hired with my first grant was Jude Dini who is now running the lab that I've retired from. And <clears throat> he, <clears throat> he is a superb technician. He is also a PhD and a, an assistant professor, but uh, he has really good hands. And that started the, uh, you know, you have to be able to do what you do really, really well in order to not have to do it 3 million times and to get to make a point. And so having, then we started with two of us who could do that. And he was extremely good, or together we were very good at training other people to be similar. And once we had more than a few people, it became a group effort to interview and hire. So I would never, ever have hired anybody who my team didn't approve of and who didn't feel that that would be an asset to the team and who you know, and oftentimes we'd be looking for something or someone that had, um, could do something that we needed to have done that we didn't, weren't able to do. So that's also a matter of respecting a new person coming in because they're contributing right away. But again, if, if everyone doesn't happily get along and work well together, um, it's hard to build a team. And so yeah, I think- I I, yes, I, I would just say, yeah, fun. It, it has to be fun. There has to be um, some, oh. yeah, so, some something in there. So um, this, this is not a question that's as specifically about you as about sort of general advice. This is a career of rejection. You know, there's going to be times when you are writing what you think, just like your first paper, is the best thing you've ever put together. And no, and it's not discussed or, or the paper is rejected without even being sent out for review. So do you have some words of wisdom for courage in those moments? So first of all, my first rule is to wait a week because you get so mad when that happens that you're not thinking constructively. <laughs> and, and then remember all the other times and all the important things that have since come out that had the same initial fate. And then, and then once you get over all this uh, emotional stuff, you start to work on it again. And some of the criticism is, is valid and is good. Sometimes you just get something that's ridiculously inappropriate and send it somewhere else. And in fact, I, I've made a few rules for myself. When I had papers that were reviewed 
by a journal that I thought gave a very unfair review. I'll, I'll never go back to the journal again. And you know, you would be surprised at some of the journals I will never go to. Uh, <laughs> because some people think they're important and that they're, that they're having publications in those journals are terrific. But, uh, you know, th so there are times when the journal is wrong and there are times when the reviewer is wrong. But, you know, you have to figure it out. And um, it's just a matter of sort of dissociating from your emotion. And, and so what is the what is the best way to handle this? First, is the work really good? And I think that for you and for me, and for Darlene, we wouldn't have put it in the first place if it really wasn't something worth putting in there. So it's you know, maybe we sent it to the wrong journal. Maybe there are some key experiments. We jumped to some conclusions without quite enough compelling evidence, or maybe we didn't express it. I mean, go through the whole process and 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 you know you'll get it published eventually. I think I've never, except for my first paper, which as I say, I still look at it every now and again. Um, everything I've submitted as to, for publication has been published and never on the first shot. So a lot of rejection. Yeah, that really highlights how, you know, we, the, these papers and grants are our babies in a way, right? We spend a lot of time with them, but yeah. You can't take yeah. it personally in order to really evaluate the critiques, right? And and try to find the exactly, totally. That I mean, that's why I said you give it a week. Yeah. Maybe some of us may take more than a week to get over the uh, the bruised ego, but <laughs> you know, re realize that it is that, and that the most important thing is that you've done all this work. You've got a contribution to make, and it's important to get it out there and figure out how to do it. So. so let's let's switch to a topic that is near and dear to the three of our hearts, and that is women in science. You definitely had a very, at least for your Banting Award, a very strong ally and advocate for getting you that nomination. Um, but as we move forward and try to be advocates for women and for younger women in science, what are what do you think are the critical things we need to do to to help um, to help us all succeed, to bring each other up. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of answers to that. So that's a big question that you're asking. But one of one of the things that I've been noticing that the olders among us have had to be develop a lot of strength and resilience, and I'm seeing a new generation coming along that doesn't have that. And this is, and that I'm not saying that anyone should be treated unkindly, although I'm sure we've all been treated unkindly. Um, but you've got to you've got to find ways to strengthen yourself. You and and we don't emphasize that enough. We're much more interested in making the world an, a fair and kind place, and the world isn't fair and it isn't kind. And um, and learning how to handle that is really, really important. And so I'd like to spend a little bit of energy not going with the flow because the flow is 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 all good and, and they don't need me there. But, uh, you know, I, I have had medical students, for example, that I was teaching in a course uh, come in tears because they failed an exam and they were, you know, their whole life was going to be ruined and could I fix it? And I just get furious. I have no sympathy, zero, because you don't fail an exam that you studied for <laughs> and you, that, you know, assuming that you got into medical school because you were capable of doing the work, you just didn't do your job. And that that anyone would expect that kind of sympathy annoys me because it means they're undermining themselves and they're undermining the the tremendous contribution that women can make and do make in terms of, of you know doing what we're doing for example the fact that we're all together and we're working to enhance 
and elevate leadership in diabetes. This is very, very important work. And if we were delicate little flowers, we wouldn't be able to do it. You got to have quite a bit of guts to, to keep on keeping on. And as I say, they haven't had all the rejections yet when they're being complaining about being unfairly treated. So I think a lot of what we should do is help people find out how to handle unfairness in a way. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a terrible story that when I was about four years old, uh, I was out playing and uh, got hit in the head with a rock by a boy and came crying home to my father who had been out with us at the time. And he said to me, what did you do? And I said, I came and I told you. He said, no, 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 you go back there and make sure that boy knows that he should never do that to you again. And he didn't tell me what to do. And, but he did teach me a really important thing. And I'm not gonna tell you what I did because it was not a good thing. <laughs> but, um, and that is that we shouldn't allow anyone to abuse us ever. And we need to find ways to maintain our integrity, which involves not allowing us to be pushed around and abused. And I'd like to see a little bit more of that being taught. So I'm not as soft as most of the women in our group. I'm, uh, you know, I want to, I, I want to make people a little bit tougher and <laughs> to use skills that we have that. Um, that you know, we might not otherwise think of using to, to retaliate against bad behaviors. Yeah, so, so um, we're, we're about at 30 minutes in, but, but I just can't really, you know, sort of resist this last, this last question because it moves a little bit away from the careers, from career advice. I, I do want to though first just reinforce the idea that women may also have different ways of being tough. And oh, uh, I have definitely the, they didn't see me coming, you know, strategy. Yes. Nobody is really expecting something. And then, exactly. you know, you get, so, but, but, um, but, but one question we didn't touch upon, which I really believe that you have huge insights into is how do you know that the question you want to ask as a researcher is worth asking? Because you're not, all right, so you shouldn't be asking a question. You should be formulating a hypothesis to which there's an answer. So, you know, let's say obesity is caused by um, a redox change caused by junk in the food that we eat. And if I were starting out today, that's what I'd be doing. I think that's a really important issue. And that would be sort of my hypothesis. And it could be right or it could be wrong. And I know how to figure that out. And if it's wrong, I'll be able to make another hypothesis that corrects the error that I made in the first place. So I think the, the first step is to choose something really important, a, a really important problem. So I had a I joked when I did my banting lecture and said that my only goal in life has been to cure diabetes and I've been a failure. And it's it's both true and it's funny, but for similar reasons that if it wasn't an important goal, then it might not be worth doing. And if I come at something that big that lots of people have tried to solve and haven't succeeded so far, then uh, you know I'm gonna be wrong some of the time, that's okay, as long as I can keep building my model. So I think it's a matter of choosing a really important question and having the courage to be, to be wrong and say I was wrong and now, you know, now I got a better idea. Yeah, so thank you so much. And um, I can't imagine a better conversation to inspire young, middle-aged and older women um, in, in terms of this phenomenal career opportunity that we have to be researchers in the field of diabetes and obesity. And, um, and I, I just 
want to thank you for being part of, of this journey with us. And Darlene, you're the boss, so you final that closing. <laughs> I want to thank both of you. This has been so fun. And uh, thank you, Barbara, for your time. I know we chatted a bit um, coming up to this interview. So thanks so much for your time and for sharing your insights and wisdom. And uh, and hopefully we can make a dent in, in our future um, in the leadership gap in diabetes for women. Um, we so. are. We're doing it. <laughs> we are. Thank you guys all so much. All right.